Hello, everybody, and welcome to our security webinar. So I am really, really psyched about this webinar because we've brought together a whole group of people that uh, that I'm actually quite excited about. We've, we've brought together people from all different uh, walks of security and cybersecurity life. So I'm really psyched to hear from them. It's been crazy. Am I getting some feedback? Or is it just me? Okay, maybe it's just me. All right, so uh, it's been a crazy time. I've seen so many hacks lately. It's it's like from having watched this over a lot of years and watch it get crazier and crazier and crazier. It's now at a point where it's like, oh my god, who doesn't get hacked? Solar Winds got hacked. The government went down on that one. Microsoft got hacked. That's that's Microsoft. That's crazy. So uh, I'm thrilled that we have all these people there to really talk about this and, and get in there on what's going on, what you need to worry about, how to deal with this, and uh, also stay around because we've got an offer for you at the end. So uh, without further ado, let's get this started. I am Norman from RCS, and with me, I'm going to go to Jeffrey first. Jeffrey Cavelli, give us your intro, please. Sure, sure. I'm Jeffrey Tabelli, the president of RCS Professional Services. We are an IT managed service provider servicing Atlanta Metro and New York Metro areas. We've been in business for over 20 years and we help clients implement technology in their business to make them uh, more efficient, effective and risk free. And the risk free part of it is where security comes in. Um, the last several years just ramping up, like Norman said, in terms of uh, how much and how often it's happening, it's gone crazy. Um, the software uh, companies are catching up and offering some protections to some to that to those degrees, Microsoft and a slew of others, and it's a key part of what we do to help our clients protect. Um, Norman, could you also mention about the uh, the chats and and questions and stuff like that before you go to the next chat? Oh yeah, sorry. A little housekeeping. You guys have uh, a little control panel situation over there on your right. There is a chat part of it where you can chat. Uh, you can chat us, and you can throw questions at us, and we can uh, get to those and get those answered. Because a throw chat, throw questions in there while it's going on, and I'll get those questions answered. And also, I'm going to stop a couple of times and accept chat uh, accept questions from the audience. And then if you guys, well, yeah, yeah that, that should be good. There's a way to raise your hand. Uh, actually, let me make sure that all you guys are muted before you get uh, before I go any further. Looks uh, like everyone's muted. Uh, is that the case? Okay. Yes. All right, cool. All right, so Jeff, Ben Marino, let's hear about you. I'm, I'm Jeff Severino with Lockton, and um, my background is I run and administrate cyber programs that are specifically aimed at small business, and I've been doing that since 2012. Um, I'm definitely not the technical expert, but what I bring is, is an insight on claim situations that we've seen over the years, and then a view of how small business interacts with the insurance market, and, and, and certainly can bring that angle uh, to the conversation today. Nice. Okay. Yeah. One of the things we mentioned to our clients is cybersecurity, cyber insurance. And uh, so um, I'm glad they're going to get a chance to hear from you about it. Richard, let's hear what you do. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Richard Landau. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for inviting me today. Uh, my company is M20. Uh, we are primarily a government contractor uh, for the last uh, over two decades. We've been serving uh, the Department of Defense and national security issues. Um, I'm on the commercial side, and my job is to translate their capabilities, the team's capabilities, into civilian applications. In the cyberspace, what that means is we basically take uh, reports that you'll learn from Chris, and uh, after uh, and go and chase bad people. Um, primarily, our efforts are post breach, post firewall and we answer four questions. Who took the data? Where is the data now? Why was the data taken? And what exactly was taken? 
those are the questions that our client wants to usually want to have answered. And thanks for having me again. Gotcha. Okay, that's a that sounds like very you know detectivey stuff. Uh, Christian, let's hear what you're up to. Yeah, thanks, Norman. Uh, Again, I just want to say thanks to everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm Christian Scott. I'm with Gotham Security. We're a boutique cybersecurity firm uh, based out of Manhattan. Uh, what we primarily do is penetration testing and social engineering. So um, what we like to do is by simulating real malicious actors and hackers, we try to create teachable experiences for organizations to kind of improve their security posture in practical and pragmatic ways. Um, in regards to that, I like to kind of, in a concise way, put it where we're like a cyber strike team, right? Uh, our customers range all the way from small businesses to multi-billion dollar hedge funds, international banks, prestigious law firms, major hospital systems, internet service providers, so on and so forth. Uh, I would say that the majority of our customers are in the financial services and healthcare verticals. Wow, okay. So now that I've got you all here, why 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 are we even talking about this is there is there anything for people to worry about what was what's a wants to jump in and give me something that maybe let's see why do why am i worried about this i'm a small little company and i've got you know i don't know 10 people 20 people do i need to worry yeah certainly that that's an excellent question uh, a lot of times um it's it's very difficult for small businesses to manage all of the uh compliance and security obligations with trying to run a business they have a finite budget they have finite time uh and so uh, how can you mesh those things together practically uh and so um really when it comes to it um I think one of the more uh, interesting reports I read as of late was from Audit Analytics back in 2019. They were talking about um, the there's approximately 640 uh, organizations that they reviewed across data breaches and what essentially what was the cost and the impact for these different data breaches that, that occurred. And uh, what they found was that public organizations, uh, while they were spending on average about $115 million uh, per data breach incident that they had on average, uh, small businesses still were actually fairly significantly impacted with about three to $4 million of average cost for each data breach that occurred. Um, I think kind of one of the more important things that, that comes from that is that there was a strong correlation between the breach costs and the length of time in which there was a malicious actor in an organization system. So, you know, obviously the faster an organization can react to a hacker breaking into the organization, that's gonna reduce the cost substantially. Uh, and in regards to that, I'm sure that uh, everyone else will be happy to elaborate to maybe some of the other impacts of a data breach. Yeah, I mean, for us, Norm, I, you know, we have the small business lens. And, you know, if you told me like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you need to have complex passwords and you need to do X and Y and Z, I'm like, I would be like, we're not IBM, we're not Microsoft, we don't need to worry. And I think that was kind of true at the time, but there's not a day that goes by. I mean, we'll, I was listening to Bloomberg Radio. They have a dedicated cybersecurity reporter. That means they have people on the payroll that just report about cyber cybersecurity breaches. Um, you know, there's not a day goes by that a friend doesn't approach me and say, you know, my email got hacked, a wire fraud, you know, crypto viruses that are, you know, ransomware attacks. It's just right and left happening every day. And um, if you were lucky enough to not have it happen to you, then it's just a matter of time if you're not putting the safeguards in place. So I really feel like, yes, you need to worry. So from uh, our perspective, uh, looking at it from post firewall, looking inward, what we see is a dramatic asymmetry of the war. It's extraordinarily easy for a bad actor to be, all the person has to be correct in terms of break, breaking in is once out of a large number, 10,000, 100,000. But on the defense side, the protection side, um, the company has to be good all of the time. And that includes not just having um, protections um, that a, an organization like RCS can provide, but also having the uh, personnel training, which is what Chris, uh, Christian uh, provides in terms of um, uh, preparing people not to click on that email's uh, anonymous link, for example. 
So if I'm a hacker, who's an easier target, a small business or an enterprise? The answer is yes. <laughs> the other thing wanted, so you would put them on par, that each are as easy to get into or whatever. Than it's, not, the other. it's not a big lift. They're not okay. spending a lot of resources to go after. It's not, I'm sorry, it's really easy to break so, in. So malicious actors, at the end of the day, what these hackers are doing, right, is it's a business. They need to monetize it, right? And so um, something that's important for people to understand is that 43% of cyber attacks actually target small businesses rather than large businesses. Large public businesses are much more complex and, and more much more mature when it comes to their information security program. Um, so while they may be a high value asset for a malicious actor, um, there is a decreased likelihood that their attack is going to be monetizable. So at the end of the day, small businesses are essentially low hanging fruit for malicious actors to quickly go through them in massive volumes, right, to make up a good revenue stream. And, and there are marketplaces in the nether regions of the internet where you can buy, if you know what you're doing, you can buy routines that are monetizable. Yeah. And it's all factored so, in. Gotcha. So I've heard monetary costs. I heard 115 million and three to four million, both crazy numbers. Uh, and, and, and I'll add to that too. I'll, yes. I'll add to that. Go, Jeff. This is let's hear it. Jeff, from the uh, insurance angle. You know, I'll just add to that too. What we we're talking about large businesses and small businesses. I don't know if I'm having some technical difficulties, but uh, I'll just add to that too. You know, we've noticed. That it, it's not just the large companies that are being targeted and sometimes the small businesses and large uh, businesses intersect in ways you wouldn't even think about and what i mean by that is we've noticed small businesses that sometimes will advertise on the on their websites who their clients are and why it's a great marketing idea the problem with that is you know all of a sudden you put starbucks you put ford you put these major brands on your website because they're partners in your business and you want to put that out there to get more business the problem is it then puts you on the radar they think uh, hey, why wouldn't I go after them? They might be in a contractual arrangement where if I've got their systems and they've got to pay me a ransom, they may be financially having to pay upstream to these big companies, in which case it's just easy money and an easy target. So I mean, we've even seen that connection where we, we go, guys, make sure you've really taken a look at your, your, your footprint out there because it may be bringing you the wrong type of attention. Ah, okay. So, oh, gotcha. So, okay, so now I've heard there's that liability, and then there's the monetary liability, and then there's, I'm sure there's downtime, and I'm sure there's a hit to your brand, maybe? Yeah, it, yeah indeed. I think... Uh, go ahead. I'll, get, I'll give it to you, Jeff, no worries. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, like, on the crypto one specifically, uh, where the ransomware is... is, is uh, you know these companies are getting it you're basically out of business at that point you cannot deal with your clients your vendors you can't ship products if that's the business you're in you can't lend money you can't you can't work and the clock is just ticking and it's just the, the reason why these guys are just making so much money is yeah you could get your data back through backup and whatever it is but that could take weeks depending on your disaster recovery capabilities, which a lot of clients don't look at or invest in, which is where Christian comes in the forefront on the planning side, uh, us as well, but it's just crippling. It's, 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 it's crazy, the, 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 the clock is ticking, there's like, you know, no time left in the game and you have to start doing business again and that's why these guys are able to succeed, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. And, and to what Norman was saying, there is a definitely a reputational element there. Um, I would say that uh, if, if you talk to most uh, business leaders and you ask them what the most important asset to their organization is, it's their brand, right? And brand management. And so uh, at the end of the day, 
uh, when you have a data breach occur um, that is, is, is public and it's out there in the ether sphere for everyone to know about, um, that doesn't just impact the reputational loss of current customers, right? And current customers that might be jumping from your, your, your small business to a competitor or something like that, but it's actually the way of years and years and years and years down the line, all the opportunity cost, right? Of customers that are gonna pass you over, right? Because they heard about you in the news, or when they go to do a security due diligence questionnaire and they ask you, have you had a data breach in the last three, five years? And you respond, it's a difficult thing to try to respond to. And usually other organizations, other competitors, where they have a clean record and they differentiate themselves with a secure uh, security posture and attack surface, you know, customers are gonna go with them. Gotcha. So, Okay, so well, let's hear some. Let's. I, can't, I just want to get into what what have you seen happen? Like I know what I've I've seen, and I'm just curious, like some of the crazy things you guys might have seen. Uh, actually, Richard, I mean Jeff, you want to jump in on this one? Sure, I can I can give you all kind of claim scenarios, and and again, I think two years ago it was data breach, data breach, data breach. I um, shifted a bit. Not only do you have the data breach issues out there, you've got the social engineering, and, and that's fraudulent funds transfers. And so I'll give you those. And 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 again, I, I've even seen it within our own organization. These these guys are so sophisticated. They will go ahead and create an account that looks like a, a person in the organization. So whether it's a controller, a head of HR, an executive assistant, and they'll send an email to someone that controls funds in the organization saying, hey, we need to send this amount of money here or there. And it looks like a normal business transaction. Next thing you know, the money's gone. And so uh, that happens That happens regularly. Um, I can also tell you, um, I've seen it's the accidental loss of private data. I think that's another one. So we're always focused on, oh, they're going to hack and get me. And while certainly that's a huge issue with the extortion and, and the phishing, um, you've also got organizations that have sensitive information in there. And what do you do if you accidentally release it out into the marketplace? That's where the insurance comes into play. I'll give you one of the biggest ones out there right now is uh, CVS Pharmacy had a uh, new drug for, for HIV. And so they went into their marketing department and database and they sent out clear label envelopes to anyone that had that they knew was HIV positive. But on the front, they literally had the person's name, address, and are you HIV positive? Yes or no. And it had yes. And it was clear to anyone who picked up the piece of mail that this person was HIV positive. That's a major violation of uh, health protocol. So when you relate that to your own small business, um, what are the things that can go wrong around things that you need to be keeping secure? Wow. Well, that sounded like a bit of a screw up there. Um, Christian, what sort of ways do hackers use to get in? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, most malicious actors, um, they're gonna be using some element of both social engineering as well as exploiting the lack of technical controls that exist in an environment. Um, so I know that a lot of organizations, they'll reach out to us, they'll have us do a pen test. And a pen test is very much focused on looking at the technical oh, systems test. like your firewall. Second, pen test? Sorry, yes, what's a pen, pen test? test. Yeah, so penetration testing, right, is when yeah. you're you're specifically looking at the vulnerabilities uh, of uh, of a network, uh, servers, web applications, mobile applications, and then what you're doing is you're emulating a malicious actor who's exploiting those vulnerabilities and then gaining access to confidential data or gaining access to confidential systems and then laterally moving about. So a lot of organizations, again, they'll, they'll ask for a pen test. They'll have a pen test done from a technical standpoint, but they completely don't think about that social engineering factor. It's left out of the picture there. And hackers don't operate in a vacuum, right? So usually a malicious actor is going to be chaining the social engineering element together with the technical vulnerabilities in your environment. A perfect example would be when a malicious actor convinces an employee to open up an attachment right, they might have a payload on that and that payload then infects a workstation. And then the malicious actor jumps from the workstation into the rest of the corporate enterprise environment. Aha, uh -huh. so uh, something that came in on email. 
Oh, and def de definitely. I mean, you, you, you don't just have a, a email uh, being an attack vector, but uh, one of the things that we love doing uh, when we have the opportunity to earn somebody's business and doing social engineering uh, and emulating a real advanced persistent threat or a real hacker with the intent of breaking into an organization uh, is actually impersonating vendors, impersonating potential customers, right? Setting up fake link, LinkedIn, fake websites, all that kind of stuff, right? Getting on a sales call with somebody and talking with them and saying, hey, you know what? Um, I, I, I like what you guys are selling. Um, can we can we can we get an NDA in place? Here's my NDA. And then that has a payload in it, right? Or when they go to click on the NDA, it says, oh, hey, you need to log into Office 365. And the person puts in their username and password. Malicious actor then gets that and then can go reuse that, right? So uh, email is just one of the many vectors. But obviously, you have uh, what's called voice phishing or vishing, right? So calling people up on the phone, right? And people actually setting up meetings and doing what's called calendar injection attacks, where you know I can put what looks like a Zoom or a go to meeting, right? onto your calendar, right? And it's actually a malicious link, right? So there's a lot of different vectors when it comes to social engineering. Yeah, from, another, uh, sorry, go ahead. from our experience, um, it's amazing how often it's not just a cyber issue, but it's an employee, a personnel issue. And uh, uh, that needs to be part of the overall program of the company. Uh, know, not just know your customer, but know yourself and know who your employees are. Uh, we have a recent case where in the financial service industry, um, it turns out the uh, CIO uh, was playing in the nether regions of the internet and uh, was going in, in a rather juvenile amateur way. Um, he was followed back, uh, let's call the guy Sasha, by Sasha, who um, tunneled into an extraordinarily large company um, and uh, ended up stealing 30 gigabytes of data. Uh, we found the data in a server in Minsk um, and we we're basically staking out the place. But the, the, the big problem with all of this is not only uh, the fact that that data had extraordinarily large customer data. So I, let me see if I can get the apostrophe right. The customer's data the data was from customers that were extraordinarily large, huge companies' data. So there was a reporting to the, the client issue. There was a, a reporting to this SEC issue. And the CIO was actually, there's an a internal politics issue because the CIO was actually part of the solution. He was the front person to go to the clients. It, it was just a, almost an intractable problem because there was no learning for one thing and the data is still out there and we're still watching it's in a server in a folder and the folder's name yeah. is the folder's name in cyrillic writing is another loser translates to another company loser's data crazy I I guess. Guess this thing out right now i'm sorry I, and you guys are sitting there staking out this folder right now? Yeah. Is that what's happening? Waiting. Yeah, usually after folks steal data, if they're going to reuse it, they're, they they sit on it. Could be nine months, could be a year and a half. And then they sell it. Wow. Oh, and that was the CIO. That's the technical guy that did that. Yeah. You can say technical. Okay. Yeah, no, so, Jeff, I, on the subject of... Uh, uh, of social engineering and teaching users, what do you have? In terms what can of, we do to things? Huh? Oh, in terms of uh, social and so so great. Thankfully, like I said, uh, you know, unfortunately, the the man, the, the vendor side, like the Microsofts of the world and all the all the all the players involved, where they're playing from behind, right? So they're generally reacting to like something that happens, and then it's like, okay, we got to stop this from happening. So, you know, phishing and whatever you know, methods that they have to get in. Um, so basically there are tools that, uh, simulators basically where on like the social engineering side on, you know, wedging their way in with a meeting or, or whatever it is, there's a lot of AI that's been built into these platforms um, like Microsoft Office 365 or Barracuda, you know, there's, there's a lot out there. Um, and what it could do is it could train users via simulation by sending them, you know, 
content that they shouldn't be clicking on, and then giving them basically what's called user awareness training. So it'll it'll guide them and say, hey, you shouldn't have clicked this. This is why. This is what to look out for. Hover over a link. Make sure it's the right domain. Uh, stuff like that. So that's just one thing, right? There's the other thing that you mentioned is how do these things happen that I, I don't think it was mentioned. Maybe it was, but weak passwords and the availability of people finding out people's passwords out on the internet is super super duper easy. Um, anyone could do it if if they tried. Uh, and then you get down to you people using the same passwords everywhere, um, which is a no-no because now if they do have your password, they could get it into your email, they could get into your online banking, whatever it is. And the one thing you, the, the single one thing that you could do to prevent that, that's awesome, is two-factor authentication, enabling that everywhere and anywhere, and then not using the same password everywhere, which is very difficult to do because we can't even remember our one password. How are we going to remember hundreds? Um, and there's tools like password managers that can that can uh, cater to those difficulties and challenges. So. Um, like I said, there's a lot out there that you can do to protect yourself, and it's just a matter of time if you're not doing it that something bad could happen. Uh, yeah, so for everyone out there, we, RCS, did uh, a webinar on the security landscape, and one of the things we touched on in there was the little perfect storm of technology of multi-factor authentication, password managers, and single sign-on. You use the three of those together, you get it easier logons and they're more secure so keep that in mind everybody uh we're gonna take a second to uh i think we're gonna take some questions now so hang on everybody sure that's uh, awesome, awesome. Oh, there's awesome. Esther. So far. thanks so much everyone there's some great questions here um the first one we have actually what i'm gonna do is just unmute you to ask your question um, but if it doesn't work out, then I'll read it off. So, Raul, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm going to unmute you in a second. See if I can just find your name. All right, I'll unmute you right now. Looks like you're self muted. So, if you can click the little microphone button, uh, should be showing red right now. You'll be able to speak when you're ready. There you go. How are you? Good, good, good. I was just wondering, um, is there a way to find people before they might be attempting to make a breach, like getting hitting it before they hit the wall, like people who are fishing, I guess? It's a really good question. Okay. Is, so I guess there's, there's two ways to look at this question. One is, can I find the person as in he's someone from the outside? And then also, is it one of my own employees? So who wants to jump in on these uh, answers, this question? Here we go, Richard, take it away. So if you take a look at the back of uh, Jeffrey's wall, he has eagle, dove, parrot, owl. And I, I believe that's disc. Yes, um, exactly. Richard so joined our last webinar. <laughs> so in the event that you have a consultant in the company and that consultant does testing ahead of time. And so you would need a legal uh, piece prior to that for uh, policies and procedures and opt-in and so forth. You could probably, from a heuristic basis, get a really good understanding of who in the company is rowing in the same direction, who in the company is um, uh, someone you need to uh, consider getting rid of, who in the company should you worry about? And I think this is getting to Raul's question. And so if you can get to that, who do you worry about stage, you've hit from a very broad brushstroke basis, the set of people that you would probably want to monitor. And again, there's legal components to that and employee issues and, and so forth and morale and so forth. And that might help from an in, inside standpoint. From an outsider standpoint, it's almost impossible unless you have a hint, because it's a boy, it's an ocean boiling question, um, and uh, that's my two cents. Christian or Jeff, do you have any ideas? 
Uh, I, I, I got a couple thoughts. So, so to that, oh, what, what I'll know is um, just from, from a clarification standpoint of people worrying about internal malicious actors versus not for their, their staff members. Uh, while there's cases of where that does, that does occur, that makes up a substantially small subset of security incidents that occur for organizations and for businesses. And so you, while obviously it's good to do robust background checks and all that kind of stuff, I think proactive security controls, for example, making sure that um, if somebody's an underwriter in a business or somebody's a salesperson, that they only have access to the data and to the systems that are pertinent to their role and to their description, right? This way, if something happens, even with someone in, unanticipated, right, the impact, right, is contained to a specific area, right? Um, that being said, uh, there are proactive ways to, to monitor for things uh, on uh, endpoints or on workstations, right? Uh, so malicious end user security monitoring or behavioral monitoring, where for example, if there was someone's computer, right, that for some reason is accessing all these file shares and downloading all these files, right? That would be something that would be extremely suspicious, right? So there are a lot of good security controls that can be implemented on endpoints, right? As well as any type of cloud platforms, like for example, OneDrive, right? OneDrive has security controls where you can actually get alerts when there's an employee who's downloading a suspiciously significant amount of documents or deleting a suspiciously significant amount of information. So a lot of times when somebody has, you know, uh, security controls in place for their, uh, their, their, their OneDrive or for a box or whatever, they don't actually realize that they can actually tweak that so that they can get that proactive monitoring so that they can then react faster. Um, the second part in regards to protecting people from malicious actors. Obviously, um, uh, people who are VIPs, any who, anyone who is basically a C-level, right? Those people are going to be of the greatest uh, value, right? And they're going to be targeted the most by malicious actors, right? Anyone who has a significant posture, right, on the internet in regards to social media, that kind of stuff. Sales staff, including, right, sales staff are a fantastic way of gaining a foothold into an organization, socially engineer those folks, and then move on from there, keep moving up the ladder. There are some um, uh, 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 data sanitization uh, software and services that are out there that can actually help scrub some of your personally identifiable information that are on like, all these websites like True People Finder and whatnot or True People Search, right? And that can help kind of reduce that how, how easy it is for malicious actors to collect information on your business, on your employees, right? So that the reconnaissance process is much more difficult, right? The, the, the more you make it challenging for a malicious actor to do reconnaissance on your business, right? And understand the weak points in your organization's hierarchy is going to mean you're a less attractive target for them. Right. I got to assume that there is a struggle there between the marketing guys and the cybersecurity guys. Because the marketing guys, they want information out there. They're, you know, they're trying to get people to look at their stuff. And the cybersecurity guys are like, well, come on, we, we got to hold back a little bit so that our guys don't get socially engineered. Yeah, yeah it, it, indeed. And that's that's where you, you have to balance understanding that there are certain individuals who are going to be public publicly facing. They're always going to have a, a higher uh, risk posture. And so those are the individuals you want to keep more of an eye on, right, than usual. Right. And then on Raul's question, I mean, I guess, like Richard said, it's probably easier at least to figure out from the inside, from the outside, it's, it's really tough. But like, I know, Norm, you know better than me because you're the brains behind the operation, but uh, like the Azure, the Microsoft Enterprise Mobility Suites, uh, at least it could give you an insight into like who's logging in, like from what IP, what country and stuff like that. So that could provide some detective type clues on where at least things are happening. Uh, maybe yeah, so when, yeah, Christian, when you mentioned OneDrive one of the, and, and data, like like check, having alerts set up so that if someone's downloading a whole bunch of data, we find out about it. it. Akin to that, Microsoft has their enterprise and mobility, enterprise, mobility, and security, which is a whole suite of security stuff. And one of the things in there, I think, is something you had mentioned to me just a little bit ago uh, about conditional access. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, there's things like in uh, Microsoft Cloud App Sec where it has things like what's called impossible travel, right? So that when someone goes to log in with their password and their MFA token, right, uh, it'll actually calculate, you know, okay, the person last logged in uh, here and now they're attempting to log in over here and, and over here is a couple hundred miles away and that time difference, that person wouldn't have been able to travel that distance, block that login, send a notification to IT. Uh, I would also be remiss to note that, you know, obviously the best way to understand, you know, what staff members are going to be at most risk uh, for your organization is to actually engage a third party, a third party cybersecurity company to emulate a malicious actor, right? Because they're going to do the reconnaissance. They're going to be doing exactly what a malicious actor does, right? And then providing that information to you so you understand your attack surface and there you usually provide you a roadmap to improve that from a practical standpoint. Right, so I think I've heard three things from you guys. One is train your users. Two, uh, bring security products to bear that are looking at your logins and stuff of that sort to make sure it's, there's something not weird going on there. And third was the last one you just mentioned, which is, uh, yep, slipped my mind now. That's how easy I can lose it. Bro, bro. Right, bring in a, bring in a third party to kick the tires on. Right? At the end of the day, the, the, I think probably one of the biggest things that I see is that you have businesses that are like, well, no, we're secure. We do this thing. Are you really sure about that? Oh, okay. You, you, you're doing those backups? When was the last time you saw the backup report, right? And so a lot of times, you know, you have policies, you have procedures, and that may reference to various standards that might be NIST, that kind of stuff, but it's the evidence, right? Let's get down to the evidence. And so the process of bringing in a third party to really kick the tires on something will usually be like, wow, wait, we didn't know we had those gaps. Okay, we need to close those those gaps, right? Because we, we there was poor assumptions there. And it's not a bad thing that an organization has that. That's just purely a, a process of maintenance because human beings are in, in, in you know essentially imperfect right things are going to get messed right and 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 that happens so always bringing in somebody from the outside in right you're going to glean a lot of insight i have a right, couple so other questions say, oh sorry sorry what, you, sorry what would you say to one of our clients if i said to them hey we need to bring in someone else to test and they were to turn to me and say well don't you do that yeah, um, I mean, hey, you guys are a fantastic IT managed services provider. Um, don't get me wrong, right? But again, at the end of the day, right, you guys aren't perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? And there's a process of maintenance that needs to be performed. An IT managed services provider at the end of the day should not be performing risk assessments or cybersecurity assessments or pen tests on their own customers because they're in the position of owning the IT security controls, right? And managing, help managing the security posture of an organization. So fundamentally, they're put in a an ethical position, right? And a in a legal position of it's a poor segregation of duties and responsibilities. So I think that, you know, the, the best thing to always have is, you know, you have an IT managed services provider that's, you know, helping you secure your business and run your your business, right, and support initiatives like mobility and whatnot, but then a cybersecurity uh, third party who can kick the tires on it and I would say constructively provide criticism and feedback and work with the ITMSP to improve things, right? It's not that they're doing a bad job by any means, right? It's just let's push it farther, right? Let's really kick the tires on it. Let's really understand what's happening. Gotcha. So, Sorry, Esther, back to you. No, no worries. Just to keep it moving here. Um, Tom, I'm gonna unmute you next, and then we'll get to Yan's question as well. There's a couple of good questions here. Um, yeah, this is a question for Jeff Severino. Uh, it seems like um, cyber insurance is, is a new cost of doing business. Um, so, how much is it? How much is this? Can you, can you give us, as a small business owner, any ideas on cost? Is it part of a general liability insurance, et cetera? Hang on, he is muted. Oh, I got you unmuted, Jeff S. Hang on, Jeff. Wait, you are un you are muted. Let's get you unmuted. Oh, I. Uh, Jeff, you have your, uh, in your little panel, it should be the second button from the top, the microphone should be red. Just click on that. 
No, let Jan? me uh, unmute Yan in the meantime to ask his okay. question and we'll maybe address. We'll come back to Jeff. So, Yan, it looks like you're just self muted. Hope I pronounced your name right, but feel free to click the little microphone and you should un be able to unmute yourself. I have you unmuted on this end. I guess you could just read the question if not. Yeah, if not, I will do that. Um, so Jan's question was, what's the most efficient way to prevent surface attacks? Not sure who wants to take that one, maybe Christian or... I, I'm happy to give the opportunity to, to Richard or Jeff. I know I do, a, I, I do a lot of flapping in my mouth. I'm happy to take it though. Anyone else? Well, no, I don't know the answer to that question, Norman. Christian, uh, or you're good. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so to that. So, the best way to pre prevent um, uh, the preventative measures for your attack surface for your organization, to be perfectly honest, first implement a very, very basic vulnerability scanner, something like Nessus or OpenVos, something like that. OpenVos, open source, right? It could be deployed by an IT person, usually in an hour, an hour and a half. Nessus is about $2,500 a year, unlimited endpoints that you can scan, right? Get something that's doing some basic vulnerability scanning on the external surface first. I would also recommend deploy it internally as well, because People rely way too much on the network perimeter, right? And it's so easy to get past the network perimeter by social engineering, somebody getting into a laptop, right? That laptop comes in the office and you jump off from there, right? So that being said, run vulnerability scanning internally as well, right? That's gonna provide you a lot of insight. Vulnerability scanners are kind of that first initial step, very low effort, right? But sometimes they can provide false sense of confidence, right? Because there's unfortunately some false negatives and there's a lot of false positive noise, but it's a good starting point. And then I would say, after you feel comfortable that like you're getting data from the vulnerability scanners that's saying or indicating you feel like you're secure, that's when you wanna bring in a third party to do some penetration testing and really kick the tires on it because that's the next step of taking the vulnerability, right? From a theoretical standpoint and actualizing it right exploiting the vulnerability digging into the system and seeing how a malicious actor can move throughout the organization so start with some cheap vulnerability scanners first i think that and and also just reducing the attack footprint is, is another good strategy like nothing nothing or as little as possible should be internet directly internet facing and having vpns in front of things for employees who need to gain access i mean if you have a website, it shouldn't be, you know, it should be in a demilitarized zone, whatever that means, somewhere else, not on your network. Um, and uh, there are things you could do, but uh, simplification and, and reducing the attack footprint is probably the single best way, other than, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And that's where Christian said, you know, basically run scans from the outside and then you can kind of see where your holes are. And, and I think I'm, I think I'm back. So my whatever technical difficulties are fixed. I, I figured I figured nobody wanted to talk insurance anyway. Um, but you know, back to the gentleman's question. To to back, I, I would just tell you, you know, one insurance has become extremely affordable uh, for small businesses in the cyber market. So you know, that's definitely part of the plan. I think everything that we've talked about today, a small business owner ought to sit down and think about, you know, from his employees to his key systems, you know, his security providers and, and all of that. And then the insurance piece as well. It's not only affordable, it's just easy to apply for. A lot of a lot of entities out there are, uh, are really working with small businesses to know that they can't kill them with 20 page applications and things that they don't understand. So um, certainly think that's, uh, relevant in the market and the last thing i would say i wanted to add to some earlier conversation a really simple thing a small business owner can do is just have an internal process around who has control of funds in the company who has the ability to ach and why on behalf of the company it is a, a simple thing and i'm just shocked at how many small businesses haven't thought about it have an internal policy and procedure that says look before i press send on sending that money I call to the end receiver, I check the account number and check that the receiver is who they're supposed to be. Certainly if it's a repeat account number to the same entity, you wouldn't have to do that over and over again. Nobody would expect that. But every time you have a new account number to someone you're shipping money to, that ought to be your company procedure. It's a low cost, no cost way to really put a line of defense into your business. So I thought I'd add that as well. 
Yeah, and I could just add that, like, I, I agree with Jeff. Like, the when we, when we were doing cyber insurance as a as our own company um, a few years back, just the questionnaires were just wildly off in terms of what you protecting. Like, it was mainly website facing stuff, and it wasn't like inside the corporate network kind of stuff. And now, again, playing from behind because we're, we're catching up with things. I think the same thing on and it kind of exactly said like if you get a crypto then we're going to pay for it. I don't know it's like it seemed to be much more relevant today and easy than it was and it wasn't that much it was like a few thousand bucks a year Richard you should be unmuted now yeah thanks so much yeah was there if you wanted to jump in there so I think we had oh just one last question um was just somebody mentioned that they're using vpn now does that have any impact yeah so um i mean it's 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 fairly standard for for people to use corporate vpns to gain access to servers that might be uh on premise you know in the you know company headquarters that kind of stuff um and um that that's that's fine and dandy that the traffic's encrypted in transit but uh, at, at the end of the day, um, it's still somebody's accessing that from a computer, hopefully not a, a home computer, hopefully a, comu a computer that's managed by the company still, because, you know, if it's a home computer, it's got malware on it, malicious actor is going to be able to still screenshot it, key log it, all that kind of stuff. Doesn't matter if you're on the VPN or not, right? Um, and so you still want to have a corporate PC, VPN, and into internal resources, that kind of stuff, right? Um, but it, again, malicious actors, they can get through VPNs and Citrix portals fairly easy. Uh, especially if you're uh, doing social engineering, you set up a really good, you know, looking, uh, authentic looking uh, Citrix or VPN uh, portal, right? People put in their credentials, even multi-factor authentication tokens can be stolen, right? It just asks for it and puts it in on your behalf, right? And then the malicious actors in and you have no clue. It just flies right over your head there. So, um, I would also say that there's a, perhaps a second component. When people talk about VPNs, uh, I, I hear it all the time watching YouTube videos, like get NordVPN, get VPN here, VPN there, and, and all that kind of stuff. Like when people are like, you know, maybe working remotely at a Starbucks or something like that. Uh, VPNs from a, like a regular uh, uh, consumer standpoint, uh, that, I mean, certainly there's some level of value there, but it's not as much value as you would think, right? They always say like it provides military grade encryption, but when you go to the majority of the websites that you're visiting every day, uh, Facebook, the VPN Citrix portals, any type of important portals that might be like ADP, all that kind of stuff, that's all encrypted with HTTPS and TLS, which is military grade. All encryption already. So um, indeed, those those VPN services like NordVPN and whatnot. Um, that again, there's value maybe in like you know people streaming movies in other countries and whatnot. But you're just moving the trust point from your internet service provider or maybe Starbucks's network, right, to the VPN provider. And NordVPN and other VPN providers have been hacked before, right? So it's not no, it's it's not a foolproof strategy uh, by by any means. I, I would uh, also caution strongly using a vpn that is not approved by your msp or your internal it department if it's free it's probably from china if it's china it's porous we actually broke a case of a um uh person uh who was uh stalking another person because uh, he was using a China-based VPN, and uh, it brought in uh, malware to his uh, laptop, which enabled us to get access to specific data to identify him as the right as the bad actor. So there you it, go. Uh, wow. Don't do stuff for free. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you guys actually, that, I love that question because it touches on what's going on now, right? So COVID-19, quarantine, everyone's home. How has this changed the the landscape of all this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely opened up the door in the favor of the bad guys, I would say. Um, everyone's using their home machines, which are not you know, adhering to corporate best practices, don't have softwares that they need, and 
you know, VPNing or remote controlling. Um, a lot of companies are had to rush to give their employees access to the corporate network while they were home for months. And in the process of doing so, they loosened whatever restrictions they had in place or they allowed their employees to use machines that are vulnerable and the, uh, the damage can be done much easier than it was before in these cases, in my opinion. So how do we fight that? Anybody? Well, I, I do want to just add, add a little bit more to that, right? So the the FBI, the uh, FBI uh, IC3, that's the Internet Crime and Complaint Center. Um, they actually reported a the last statistic that I saw was there was a 300% increase in cybersecurity attacks and reported cybersecurity crimes uh, after COVID-19, right? And COVID-19 is great for uh, malicious actors because of all the panic, right, and 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 and, and people being emotional, right. Um, that's great from a social engineering standpoint, not just in regards to identity theft, right, and as well as all the IRS stimulus payments that people have been getting, but also from a corporate standpoint. Uh, I would say that there's also there is this big transfer uh, from corporate working, right, to working from home, which Jeffrey was talking about. And unfortunately, most organizations um, they've built their, their security model around network segregation and securing the organization. That's more of a 2000s type of model. And, and, and unfortunately, that meant that it was very difficult for them to adapt in a timely manner, right? And really what people should be doing is focusing on what's called zero trust network security, which is never trust any network, even if it's a corporate network, right? Focusing more on endpoint security and investing their resources into protecting the endpoints, right? And then I would also say that probably like a last big component of uh, COVID-19 impacting the cybersecurity uh, landscape is the fact that um, the economic hardship has made COVID-19, uh, has created a, a climate where people are much more open to becoming hackers and many, many more hackers joining the ranks because these there's a lot of people across the technology industry and across all types of industries being laid off, right? The wealth is then concentrated with a couple of technology organizations like your Microsoft, like your SolarWinds, like your Amazon, which makes hacking look much more lucrative, right? Because that's where the resources are going, right? Uh, and uh, indeed, I, I mean, everyone knows about SolarWinds or Ryan hack. Everyone's also heard about the recent exchange hacks impacting up to 60,000 different organizations uh, ac ac across the United States alone. And these are the, the in subsequent impacts that we've been seeing from COVID-19 and all these relaxed security controls and, and people being mobile. And so now the malicious actors are now monetizing that. They've been in these systems for quite some time and now they're monetizing that effort and moving forward. Yeah, and also like just coming to mind as, as you're talking about COVID, like anytime there's like a, a craziness going on, like I've, tr I've heard things where People are getting emails about getting a vaccine and they're signing up for a vaccine and putting their information in or, you know, just just the fact that it's top of mind and, uh, you know, everyone's got anxiety about it. That also creates just a lot of opportunity for them, um, unfortunately. From our, from our perspective, the emotional component is very strong. Um, we deal a lot with uh, uh, high net worth individuals being uh, attacked uh, online, whether they're a professional athlete or a, a family office. And there's been a sharp increase of what we're calling uh, rabbit boilers. Uh, that's a fatal attraction illusion. Um, right. And, and uh, it's, it, 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 it's been an upswing in the last uh, Six months alone, it's been increasing. I would say thirty or forty percent in terms of uh, our activity. Yeah, and the only so thing I would, I would go, Jeff. No, I was just gonna say, you know, we had a we had a claim situation where you know it's just something we never would have thought of. The the bad actor went after uh, one company, but it was a husband and wife on the on the same Wi-Fi, and then he figured out well the wife happened to be an attorney and she's got much more valuable information to go after. So with that bridge there, because of the work from home environment, it created an opportunity. And so it was just something we 
we never thought of. And then I also tell folks, I said, you can have the greatest fishing and organizational training for your employees, but then you put them in a work from home environment and just have a little bit of a view of their day. I mean, they're running hundred miles an hour. They may have kids at home that they're schooling. And imagine trying to police them not to click on something in that environment when they're rushing to keep up, uh, you know, three or four balls in the air. So I think it's just created a, a window of opportunity that just wasn't there when people were in a more predictable environment. I agree. Okay, and so, oh, yeah. so uh, let me hear what we, what the company should do if they get hacked. What do people do? I was going to jump in on this one. They know you all have an idea of what you should definitely do if you get hacked. So go. Christian, I'm going to let I'm going to let the other folks take it first, and then I'll. Well, I'm actually, um, the first call of action is going is contact your attorney. <laughs> why you need privilege you especially need if you're in, you need to have the potential you need to do everything possible with the potential that there may be some ramifications whether it's uh if you're in a uh what's it called if you're in a regulated environment or if you uh, are dealing with a person a ppi personal uh Personal identifiable information (PII), PPI, PII. You 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 need to have the uh, attorney uh, give you guidance on where to go and what to do, and have it all underneath privilege. That attorney should be able to take a look at, for example, uh, the insurance policy, and create a strategy to win. Uh, based upon uh, the insurance policy and the risk profile, and then and from that perspective, then go after it from a technical world. My company, you don't want to ever call because we're the last. We're, we're the last. We're the last ones in the block. It's when the, your pickle is extraordinarily difficult and you are intractable and you have absolutely no hope, but you have to do something, and that's when we get involved. Yeah. But before that, you need to talk to Jeff's group, Jeffrey's group at RCS, and then you need to talk to Christian's group. Right. I, I would say like also like it depends on the breach, right? Like like if for what Jeff's referring to, and it's it's a wire fraud, and the the money got sent. Um, that controller is never going to do that again. Uh, <laughs> they already learned their lesson, and uh, the damage is done. And what you need to do is you have to work on prevention, which is a lot of these technologies and best practices we've been talking about. And unfortunately, depending on the size of your organization, it could take months or years, depending on how much is there, to put everything in the right place. Um, these systems are not easy to transition from one to another. It takes time, planning, selection process. So you really need to start talking, having those conversations now because they take time to implement, I would say. And then on the other side, I mean, Christian, you could talk about it, but like data breaches and stuff like that, that I'm sure you could speak a wealth of knowledge on what to do on those sorts of um, breaches. Yeah, so so I, I I really appreciate Norman's question about what to do in regards to the data breach, and I definitely concur with with, with Richard. I think I, a better question actually is how do we prevent how do we prevent the data breach, right? Thank you. Or 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 what? Well, how do we prevent the a security incident from occurring? And I I think every organization should have a very basic, at least basic, one pager cyber incident response uh, uh plan, right? So know who your attorney is. Know who your cybersecurity team is going to be. Know who, who your, your your IT team is going to be, right? If you know those contacts, right? You have their contact information written down. You know when you can contact them, right? That means that you're going to be able to respond to the incident much faster and contain the threat, right? I've seen so many situations where I do penetration testing for large insurance firms, uh, international banks, all that kind of stuff. And we get a foothold into the environment. We breach the environment, right? We start laterally moving about. And the team was so apprehensive about informing users to reset their passwords that if they told the users to just reset their passwords immediately, it would have locked us out. It would have stopped us right then and there. But they took too long, right? Gave us three days. And then we get all the way up to the highest ad admin access in the entire organization to get access to all these social security numbers and bank account numbers, all that kind of stuff, right? So 
I think just having a basic one page plan, right, of your cyber incident response plan, these are the people who are going to be involved. Here's their contact information. Make sure that they're consenting to that, right? There are so many cybersecurity companies that have zero dollar tiers, right, for retainer for incident response, right? So you know how much you're going to be paying per hour upfront, all that kind of stuff, right? So that you don't you don't get stuck bickering with somebody, right, about a proposal or how much you're going to be paying to have someone come in and do the incident response work, right? You just hit the ground running. Makes sense. Gotcha. So I heard, I heard, have a plan, have a plan of what you're going to do, who you're going to call, uh, and I, you touched on it slightly, but act fast. Yes. When it happens, move, call, do, call and do and change and act on your plan. Don't keep it quiet. Yeah, don't, don't don't be apprehensive about what you're doing, right? C commit commit to the action, right? It, it, if you tell everybody in the organization to reset their passwords or you force reset everybody's passwords, right? That may be an inconvenience at, at, at the most and a pain in people's ass, right? But at best, you just contained a malicious actor that's going to save you millions of dollars. It's going to save you your reputation, all that kind of stuff. And we Jeff, have like, I feel like two people who have just waited way too long on this. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Like, we have still like 70% of the people on, so maybe we'll keep going. But, Jeff, from an insurance claim perspective, I just because I've never lived this or experienced it, like, does it matter when you report it to, in order to get compensated? Like, how does that work? Absolutely. I mean, speed is key. And, um, you know, and I would say, too, you want to you want to make sure you can report incidents and or claims. Some some people say, hey, I got to wait till I have the lawsuit and this thing's really ballooned out into a big issue. Uh, we say, hey, well, if it's an incident and it's at the point where an executive or an owner needs to put it on letterhead and get it in, get into us fast, because the faster we have it, the faster we can go to work. And, and in terms of, of 72 hours on, on, on lost money. We have so many cases where people are embarrassed and then they contact their bank and they and they wait sometimes up to six months while the bank is processing and working through it. You're, you're long gone. We have no chance of recovery. The first 72 hours is key. And I 100% agree with what Richard said on the attorney client privilege. Uh, make sure if you do have an insurance policy, you understand how that claims process works. Our, our starting point is with a large law firm that puts the initial call under attorney client privilege. It's, it's a massive importance and he, he made a great point. I have another question for you. When when they when a claim is made, not necessarily a claim, but you, you get a report that something happened from a client that has a, ca a policy with you guys, are you guys actually helping them and inserting resources? Maybe not on the tech side, but like negotiation, ransomware, stuff like that. Are you guys like getting involved over there? Absolutely. It, again, our process goes to an attorney, attorney client privilege. He's the initial point of intake. And then depending on what type of loss it is, uh, each entity would have the same type of setup. We have a panel of, of service providers that we've worked with over the years, um, depending on if it's ransom or if it's social engineering and the different law firms and experts around the country that we rely on to then take over those claims and work with the clients at at the, at the, so it's the best process for everybody involved. And I will tell you, there's a lot of bad actors out there and bad partners. I mean, so it's taken a number of years to really get the right trusted network in place to where we feel good about, about the operation. Good to know, I didn't know that. All right, so I'm gonna start wrapping things up. I wanna give each of you like a minute to talk about something you would like to see the clients do just just something you'd like to see the clients do uh I, i'm sure everybody's got like their oh my god i wish i could just say this to a client just one time and have them hopefully do it so now is your chance i'll, uh, I'll take it because we're out with clients and we're like you have to do this and um Sometimes money's tight, business is not easy. You know, margins are, are slim as it is, so to spend more uh, hurts sometimes, but just two factor, anything and everything um, from our perspective. Uh, I'm gonna add, add another one, shift to clouds as much as you can, um, but uh, two factor, anything and everything that's inside your network, outside your network, cloud stuff, whatever it is, I think that's the single biggest thing for us. Okay. 
So yeah, I heard two factors for our security and, and reduce some of the network, some of the risk by moving stuff into the cloud. Uh, Richard, what do you so, think? Uh, the word comes to mind is prepare. Uh, you need to talk to Jeff and make sure that there's a, a, a good insurance policy in place. You need to talk to Jeffrey uh, to uh, make sure that the castle is fortified and you need to talk to Christian in order to test it from time to time. Awesome. Good. Uh, Jeff? What else do I have here? Jeff is slightly frozen at the moment, so we're going to move on to Christian for now. Get back to you, Jeff. Yeah, if, if I was going to say, I'd make it five easy bullet points. Uh, like Jeffrey was saying, multi factor authentication, super duper important. Like Richard was saying, um, have have a plan. Come up with some basic plans, right? Uh, reach out to people. My... Oh, I think we got Jeff again. Here, let me finish up my thought process here. So, yeah, ha ha having a, a plan, reaching out to some third parties, right? Because they're going to allow you to understand what your cybersecurity budget should be, right? You have a budget, right, and you're planning for the future, then it's no longer expensive because you're anticipating the cost for things, right? Uh, I would also say uh, end user security awareness is extremely important, making sure that you know every staff member at least has two hours of some level of training every year is going to save you a whole lot of hassle down the road, perhaps millions of dollars. And then I would say probably one of the last major points that I would make is focus on endpoint security more, less on network security, right? So as Jeffrey was noting, shift things to, to, the, to the cloud, shift things to software as a service, right? Obviously, staff have to have a way to access those things, right? So secure the endpoints because the endpoints are still a vector to get into the cloud infrastructure, into the, the cloud environment. A lot of people, antivirus is not nearly good enough, right? Uh, a good IT managed services provider or a good IT department should be implementing a lot of robust security controls across the workstations to make sure that they're encrypted at rest, make sure that there's logs that are being stored centrally, all that kind of stuff. So uh, to that, I'll let, uh, I'll let Jeff uh, chime in. Let's see, do we have Jeff? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think... frozen. yeah, you guys hear me? Oh, there yes, you go. Yes, I hear you. Go for it. All right. I would just say there's a lot of low cost, no cost things out there now where maybe there wasn't years ago for small businesses. So, you know, even if it's just sitting down and thinking, what are my key accounts? What are my key systems? Do I have a backups for those systems? Are they separated from my network? I mean, just basic stuff that they can do uh, to, to put some planning in place. Uh, and then obviously work their way into some higher level stuff that we discussed today as well, just to make sure they've been well thought out and well planned out. Nice. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we are going to wrap this up. There's a couple of things I want to mention. One, uh, we are running an offer where you can have uh, an hour with Christian to discuss all of this security stuff. Because, you know, he knows it and he's got something to tell you about it. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. If you are interested in that, contact Esther. Um, and uh, Esther, what else do you want in closing? Well, I just wanted to mention, um, first of all, thank everybody so much for your time and for joining us. It's great great to have you all. I know you all have so much more to share. I've heard some of it myself. So we'll send everybody their contact information following. You can always reach out to uh, us at info at rcsprofessional.com and we'll get you in touch with, with anybody that you would like uh, from this panel. And I just wanna mention our next webinar is gonna be on April 22nd at 2 p.m. It's a totally different topic. Uh, we have five business coaches or four business coaches coming to speak, each of them with a different um, coaching methodology, Strengths Finder and some others. So different topic, but no less relevant. And I hope we'll all see you all there. Um, and outside of that, always reach out with any questions or follow up. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you so much to all our panelists. Thank you, Norman. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks for putting it together. All right. Super. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Take care. Take Bye care.